My name is Deborah Lupton and I'm the leader of the Vitalities Lab in the Centre for Social Research in Health and the Social Policy Research Centre at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And I'm going to talk in this presentation about the story completion method. The project I'm going to talk about is called the Health Information Story Completion Project. And the key research questions in this project were what sources of information do people look for when they are facing a health-related problem? What roles are played by online and in-person sources of information and support when people are dealing with this health problem? And what can the process of writing narratives tell us about the more than human dimensions of dealing with health dilemmas? The background to the project in terms of designing the story stems and also doing the analysis was that of more than human theory. And as this image shows, more than human theory sees humans as always already coming together with other living things such as other animals or plant life, but also with non-living things, objects, materials that they touch and, or wear or use in some ways, um, the effective forces that they feel when they're going through their lives and interacting with these, with other humans or with other living things or non-living things and they're constantly going through time and space and place as they're moving through their lives. Why would you choose the story completion method for your own research project? One reason is that narratives are a great way to communicate biographical details. So basically to talk about what happens in people's lives as they go through the life course. They're a great way to talk about relational connections with other people and non-human things. And also how people feel about topics. Writing stories will always involve drawing on your own experiences and feelings, as well as shared discourses, norms and imaginaries. So even if you're writing a story about somebody else, a fictional character, then to construct that narrative, you always have to draw on your own understandings, the meanings that you work with in your own life, the kinds of narratives that you are aware of or that you can imagine. The story completion method can also be used for sensitive topics that might be difficult for people to talk about in relation to their own experiences. So it's a useful approach if you're dealing with an issue that people might feel quite uncomfortable about talking about if you're asking them questions about their own experiences or beliefs or attitudes. When they're writing about fictional characters, sometimes they can feel more comfortable about telling a story about those characters rather than talking about themselves. So another good thing about this approach is it's a departure from the usual question and answer format of qualitative social research. Like the usual focus group or interview format, semi-structured interview, when you're basically firing questions at people and they're responding to you in that Q&A format, the story completion method invites people to think creatively. They get to imagine new worlds and new worlds for other people. The process. So these are the basic ways that you conduct a story completion project. First you select the characters for the story. You decide if you're going to give a character a gender uh, if you're going to give them an age, you may choose not to do either of those things. You don't have to specify what ethnicity they are, for example, what country they live in, but you may choose to do that. So it's up to you how you describe your character when you set up the story. You formulate what's called a story stem, which is the big beginning of a story. You provide a sentence or two which outlines the character, the situation the character is in, and then the next part of the process is you ask participants to complete the story. What do the characters do? What do they say? What do they feel, for example? Those are the kinds of things you want 
for story writers to focus on in the story. So you can either do this in a very old style fashion, you can have participants um, who you are in the same room with, for example, who you ask to use a pen and paper um, format to write their stories, or you can do it in an online format. You can use SurveyMonkey, for example, or Qualtrics, and just use open text boxes. And people just write their story completion straight into those open text boxes. You need to decide whether you want one story stem or more. I've used three or four story stems in my own projects, but some researchers have only used one. So you just have to work out um, the time commitments of your story writers. How much time do you want to ask of them? Obviously, the more story stems you ask them to complete, the more time it demands of them. Most stories are in the third person, but they can be in the first person. And some researchers have used stories when, so you can talk about, I did this and I did that, but still ask people to write a fictional account. How many participants slash story writers should you have to complete your stories? Well, enough to gather a good range of completed narratives, say at least 20. I've had in my past projects around 30 or 40 people around that number, but I have seen other researchers who have fewer than that or have quite a few more than that. This is the story stems, the three story stems that I used in the Health Information Story Completion Project. The first one was about a woman called Isabel. Isabel wants to improve her health and fitness, but doesn't know how to go about this. The second stem is about Tom. Tom has been feeling unusually sad and anxious for a few months. He wonders whether this is normal and what he should do about it. The third person I called Alex, which is a gender neutral name, so I leave it up to the story writers to decide what, what, if any, gender they're going to give the character of Alex. And the situation of Alex is Alex has been sexually active over the past year and has recently noticed some unusual symptoms that could be signs of a sexually transmissible infection. Alex needs further information to work out what is going on and what to do. So for all three stories, I ask story writers, what happens next? Please write four or more sentences in the box provided below to finish the story. And I did use SurveyMonkey to do this project. So there was that open text box that people could type their stories straight into. Now, the reason I chose these stories is because I, I really was interested in, in these kinds of quite common health problems that people face. And because I've done a lot of research recently on digital health technologies and the way that people use digital health technologies, such as online search engines or apps or wearable devices or online discussion forums or social media groups, I was quite interested if I pose these dilemmas, whether people would tend to talk about the characters going online for look, look, to look for information, for example, or whether there would be non-digital ways that they sought to resolve their dilemmas. So I left it very open in the story stems about that. I didn't suggest at all um, where the characters might look for health information or support. I left it up to the story writers. I chose the example of Isabel because as a woman, women are constantly placed in a situation when where they're positioned as worried about their body weight or, or appearance. So that's a common dilemma that many women of across the age groups really face. I chose the issue for Tom as a man um, because men often do struggle with um, feelings of anxiety or depression or other unsettling feelings that are affecting their, their state of well-being. And they often do struggle finding a way to find support for those issues because they tend to be very gendered issues and the idea that men don't give in to those sorts of feelings is quite a dominant norm in um, high income societies like Australia. 
I chose the situation for Alex, the non-gendered character, because that again is a is a very sensitive issue. That's possibility of having a sexually transmissible infection, but a very common issue. And I was interested in the kinds of resolutions that people might be able to imagine for that character. An example of a completed story. So here's an example from the first story stem about Isabel wanting to improve her health and fitness but not knowing how to go about this and what happens next. She goes down a wormhole on the internet and ends up listening to the first 10 minutes of eight different podcasts. She figured that it was something she could, should be able to speak to her doctor about, but she hadn't had a physical since she stopped birth control. When she goes to the bookstore, she scans the aisles looking for something that resonates. At the grocery store, bolded headlines scream a million different promised goals that the glossy paper felt too cheap to trust. Ultimately, she flirted with the philosophies of dozens of articles, never quite gaining the motivation to sustain a lifestyle change. So in my analysis of stories, what did I look for? I looked for the narrative arc. What happened? How the story resolved or not resolved? So if you think back to that Isabel story, she actually didn't resolve her dilemma. And that was a fairly common way to, to complete a story amongst the story writers in this project. What other people were involved in the stories? Did they help or hinder the main character? What were the relationships and connections between these people? What things, other living creatures, places and spaces were included in stories? What were the relationships and connections between the people and these non-human agents? What feelings and agencies were included? How did these relate to the humans and non-humans in the stories? So just to summarise the main findings of my analysis, what I found was that in the narratives, the characters were depicted as feeling, in many cases, very vulnerable about their health dilemma and sometimes unsure about who they could trust to help them. Across the stories, the internet was a helpful source of information, but too much of this information caused confusion and anxiety. People didn't really know, the characters in the stories didn't really know what to do with all the information they were finding online in many of the stories. There were gender differences, so in terms of the story about Tom, it was definitely the case that the story writers often depicted him as finding it very difficult to seek help from others. Whereas the story about Isabel, people often talked about Isabel feeling very self-conscious about her body for example, feeling nervous about going to a gym, wearing lycra outfits, um, being under the gaze of other people, um, exercising in public, those kinds of things. Online sources offered anonymity or a sense of sharing a problem and the anonymity was particularly valuable in the stories about Alex because of that very sensitive health problem that Alex faced which was being concerned about whether they might have an STD. Um, there were some interesting examples given of people finding communities online, such as Tom, finding a community where he didn't have to reveal his identity, but he was able to share his sad feelings with other people, for example. Even though online sources were in many cases presented as helpful, what I think was really interesting was that in the stories, friends, family members and health professionals were also depicted as trusted sources of, of information or health. So often people would do a bit of research online, but then they would go and talk to friends or family, or they might decide they needed to go and get some help from a health professional, a doctor or a psychologist, for example. So it wasn't as if the online resources were were acting instead of trusted other people. They were sort of working together. 
and it was also interesting to note across the stories that some places and spaces felt safer or more supportive than others. So, for example, in the case of Isabel, she did feel often nervous or overexposed in the gym. But if she had friends who were already going, who she could go with, that made things better for her. Or in some stories, for Tom as well, dealing with his feelings of sadness, being out in nature, or for Isabel, walking in a park, for example. These were places and spaces where those two characters were depicted as able to find some sense of better well-being and health. So in summary, capacities for change, wellness and recovery were opened by finding helpful information and making connections with others both online and face-to-face -face, and therapeutic places and spaces. So I'll just to end with a list of further readings that if you're interested in the story completion method, you can look these up. So there's two publications from my health information project, the, one of which was published in the journal Medical, Medical Humanities, the other in Qualitative Research in Sport, Exercise and Health. And in terms of other sources on the method of story completion, there's the website hosted by the University of Auckland on story completion, which has lots of great resources on it. And I've also written a case study for the SAGE research methods cases on the story completion method and bringing it together with more than human theory. So that can be found online as well.